welcome to Masters of Music I'm Valdemar. I am Derek. And this is episode 19. Episode no- <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Episode 19. <coughs> oh, sorry. Sorry, excuse me. Episode. <coughs> sorry, one second. <sighs> episode 19. Wow, thank God I had this vocal ease spray. This week we have Brandon Buckley. Brandon Buckley, an incredible drummer, percussionist. Uh, he's played with the likes of Shakira, Julio Iglesias, Miyavi, Perry Farrell. The list goes on and on and on. And I actually got to play a couple of jams with him. Yeah. Check out this little clip. Oh, that was awesome. Damn, if you guys like that, please subscribe if you like that kind of content so we can keep on keeping on. Yes, help us work with the algorithm so we're in the right feeds. Yeah, push that button. Yes. But we got to move on now because it's time for... Music News! What's going on out there? Got something to say? Well, I have something. The Grammys are under fire right now, or on fire. What's the expression? Uh, there's some heat under the Grammys right now. Uh, singer, songwriter, artist uh, Halsey um, t posted this whole thing on her Instagram story. She wasn't nominated. She was quite upset about it. She had a whole. She worked really hard on her album, and um, oh yeah, all the nominations came out. Um, but yeah, she she you could find it online. She wrote a whole bunch of paragraphs and stuff. But one thing that stuck out to me was uh, she kind of summed it up by saying. If you get that far, it's about committing uh, committing to exclusive TV performances and making sure you help the Academy make their millions in advertising on the night of the show. Um, so it's she's saying it's all about bribes and stuff. The Weeknd also said, first of all, The Weeknd released a great album this year, and it did really it was groundbreaking, um, record breaking, really, not really groundbreaking. In my opinion, but it was record breaking. <laughs> the Grammys remain corrupt, he tweeted. You owe me, my fans, and the industry transparency. So these artists and other artists are asking the Grammys to come out clean. Like, this is just tell what people what you do, you know? Like, because we know there's bribes happening back there. They're, they're kind of coming from somewhere. I, I'm not finding any facts under their statements, but they seem to be like in out on it a little bit because what? The weekend won a couple Grammys before, too. Yeah, won, like so three. What did you do the weekend yeah. to get those three Grammys? Yeah. If they're so corrupt, huh, how did he get those three? Yeah. Come out and be transparent, dude. Yeah, we've seen uh, Uncut Gems. You're kind of a shady guy. <laughs> yeah, man. That was a true story about him. You know that, right? Is it really? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can see it happening. <laughs> yeah. But, but that's the thing. Like, he's complaining because he didn't get more awards. Yeah. First of all... Like I said before, the Grammys is bullshit. Yeah. It's bullshit. When Zetro Tall wins over Metallica for best new metal act. That's weird that you say it's bullshit for that reason. I say it's bullshit that, like, <laughs> that's the most shitty bands. Really? I feel They're like. They're not metal, and you go against Metallica. I guess it's so. It's in the fucking name. We've had this conversation, I think everyone knows. But yeah, we have, we have. Well, that makes sense. But I'm thinking of like other, like there's some shitty music out there that's won Grammys. I don't think like, I like Kanye, but I don't think he deserves all those Grammys. Yeah, I don't even know how many he has, but he's a bunch. Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot better musicians that deserve awards. But yeah, like I said before, the Grammys is one of those bullshit things that it just helps publicize your own album. And now Hazley is not going to get publicized. Or Halsey. Halsey or. Halsey, I don't know her name, but like yeah. then may, she's mad that she's not getting that boost because after an award, you win an award. Guess what happens? You get boost in sales. Oh yeah, a bunch. That's yeah. exactly what happens. 
So um, I totally get it, but it's a bullshit award. Why do you want this bullshit award so bad? Yeah, yeah. Actually, that's pretty smart of her. She's like, she didn't get her freaking public publicity from a Grammy nomination. So now she's doing it through like con- controversy. That's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, I mean it's it's cool. She she might be right too, but it's also bullshit award. So like I don't get it. Yeah. Yeah, you're yeah you're crying that you're not getting a bullshit award. <laughs> yeah, so it's. Um, I don't know what else there is to that whole thing. I mean, I don't know. Back then, the Grammys were good. There were good artists and in general. Before like a while ago, there was Grammys were mostly deserved. I think. Yeah, but I I still say like why she wants validation. Like, what's this validation for? Like, yeah. like we talk about this. Like, if you create art that you really like. That should be all of the validation you need. You don't need somebody else to tell you, especially a corporation that sells advertising. As we know, everyone makes advertising money. I'm pretty sure Halsey has made advertising money yeah. for something. Her oh, music's yeah. been on it. She's part of the machine. So yeah. it's not like a big deal. But the, but I think this like, I've said this before, like we're just dogs in the sand. We just create the art and then the people become the authors after that. So. Yeah. They take the meaning and they make it. So just be happy with what you've made. Uh, sometimes you don't get the the awards you deserve, right? But right. the people that usually are fighting for the awards that they think they deserve, those are the people that probably shouldn't win awards. But this is me. Do you think the Grammys are actually corrupt and they're taking bribes? Yeah. Oh, wow. They take it from Pepsi. How so? Advertising. Oh yeah, no, but from artists maybe. Yeah, but the the whole thing is like, it's it's not the artists, it's the record company. Yeah, that's true. The whole thing is you Ooh, guys oh, work good... for uh, the record companies and the record companies, especially the bigger ones and the pop acts. Those are just like bribing everybody. Yeah, like you pay for radio time, you pay for this, you pay for your commercials online. You're the ones that are the ones that are actually paying advertising. You guys are. Buying the billboard time. Yeah. So yeah. it's all bribes. You're bribing somebody to sell it and to put your things out there. Yeah. Damn. That's crazy. Yeah, and it makes sense. I mean, look, we see all those artists that are nominated. They're performing that night, too. A lot of them that are going to win are already singing, like, the big songs that are the main events, which is yeah, crazy. But I think that, like, who the hell would, like, offer a band that wasn't nominated a sense to play on an award show. It's ridiculous. Only ask the people who are nominated. But I, those nominations are are corrupt, though, from the get-go. Yeah, but I think she was like, oh, like, she can't play or something. She wants to be nominated, not perform, right? Yeah. I don't know what she's fighting about, but if she wants to perform, that could be a whole different conversation. But most likely, if you're not nominated for an award, you're probably not good enough to perform that year. Yeah, or good enough meaning bullshit enough. Yeah, bullshit enough. I <laughs> yeah. know it's it's fucking controversy the whole time. Yeah. Please like write down in the comments if you guys believe that it's bullshit or not bullshit. Yeah, what do you think of the Grammys and stuff? Because I'm curious as well. And who are your favorite uh, Grammy winners as well? I don't know. Maybe we could look them up. But we got to move on because it's time for Brandon Buckley! How's it going? It's going well. It's going well. How's it going with you guys? Awesome. Fantastic. Yeah, we're just freaking, you know, doing the do. (laughs) Doing the do, yeah. Living living the the corona world. Yes, exactly. Okay, Brendan, I don't know if you remember, but you and I played one song together uh, in Lucky Strike for the Ultimate Jam Night back when it was at Lucky Strike. And it was a Philip Bino. And we're going to show it on this episode. But we played like a Stevie Ray Vaughan song. I don't remember. It was so long ago. It was like I five years remember. ago. Damn. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, uh, great. <laughs> yeah. I, was I feel singing. like we might have done some kind of uh, jam collaboration since then. Like when they're throwing people on and off stage. But yeah. I can't remember what the other one was. But I remember that one. Yeah. 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 Exactly. There's so many freaking like. And yeah, you killed it. Oh, thanks so much. It's on YouTube, too. <laughs> yeah, that was the first time I ever got to really feel like, or I ever performed with someone of your caliber, yours and Phillips. I was like, whoa, this is like, uh, before that, I was just in high school bands. I was 20, 21 back then. So I was just like, 
just getting out and I don't know. I just like didn't know what it was like to play with like you know, you guys. So I was just that was that blew my mind. Ever since then I was like trying to get better. So that was just a huge well, moment for me. Like, not only did you sound great. But also then you've all, you also realize that most musicians just want to play music, you know, and it doesn't matter if you're 20 or 40 or 60. Most most musicians are just down to play all the time, which is what I like about the Lucky Strike thing. Yeah, is, like, you know, they assemble people who just want to hang out and jam with each other on a Wednesday night. And that's really cool. That's or, so cool. or yeah, exactly. Oh, man. Oh, yeah, that, that's super cool. It's kind of like it helps bring the community back. Yeah, because I always thought of like the strip. Especially uh, that it was like dog eat dog for like the longest time until the jam nights came back, and then people like started doing that. Yeah, I'm not sure. I've I've always been in um, I've always been in situations that were more um, I guess friendlier, <laughs> right. not as much of a dog eat dog thing. I mean, I'm, there is that element of competition. Like you want you want to sound good and you want to sound better than everyone else or you want your band to be killing but i've never been in in a situation that was so bad that you want to like you want to bury people and right. <laughs> like <laughs> blow up away and make sure that they never touch their instruments ever again or <laughs> i've always felt like it's when i moved i moved to la in 2004 and i always felt felt that everyone here was so nice and welcoming and encouraging nice oh cool Damn, you got lucky old dog eat dog era <laughs> <laughs> yeah you missed skip that part yeah, yeah. No, so how did you start like playing drums and decide and end up here and like Satan's? I'm from New home. Jersey, and ah. um, I probably started drums the way a lot of people start instruments. Like uh, it was just another hobby. Like I, yeah. I skateboarded, I played sports, and I played instruments. And I, the first one was piano, and then trumpet, oh, and wow. then I thought I wanted to be in a band. And there's not a lot of piano players and trumpet players in bands. Yeah. So then I thought, ah, I'm gonna buy a used drum set off my neighbor, and I did that. And um, yeah, and then I just fell in love with it and practiced every day after school. You know, it's like one of those things that my parents didn't have to force me to take lessons or practice. I just wanted to throw on headphones and just figure out beats. Yeah. And then, um, yeah. And then I got to the point where I was like 17 or 18. I had to figure out what to do with my life. At that age, you, you have this, am I going to college? Am I going to work for, for my dad's company? I don't know. Yeah. So I decided to go to music school. And I went to, I moved from New Jersey to Miami mm. to study. At, they have a conservatory of music down there at the University of Miami. And I went, I applied and got in there. And it was great because I got to study classical jazz, composition, arranging, all sorts of things. Theory. Yeah. It was yeah. great. Damn. Wow, damn. Hell yeah. Damn. So, and lo and behold, like eventually you start freaking playing monumental tours, b gigs, unplugged sessions. You, you play with Julio Iglesias, right? I did. That That's was one of my one of my first tours when I first got out of college. Uh, God. Yeah, that, that was cool. Um, how did that happen? Like, how, did, how does that become one of your first tours out of college? Yeah. Well, it's weird. It's weird. If you look at, if you look at, like my history of music making all the people i've either recorded with whom i've recorded or gone on tour with it's all over the map and that's not by choice it just happens that i really love music and i love all styles of music and uh, and i just like i don't really kind of think of myself as only one style or i don't i never pursued only one style i just like playing with people so if some someone calls me up and they want to do a latin fusion jam, jam session i'm like yeah let's do it or they want to do a like a heavy metal band i'm like yeah let's do it it doesn't i always think yeah sounds great so uh julio iglesias i mean he's he's really like like the real deal like like one of those guys like frank sinatra or something who's yeah. just legendary singer like he's yeah. got a huge catalog of music huge amount of fans he's got he's great ears great super talented mm. and um I think a lot of the people in his band were coming, you know, lived in Miami or came through Miami. So at some point, his previous drummer was gonna, who had been with him for years, was gonna leave the gig, and you know, they started asking around who, who could fill in. And I was actually doing a recording session at the time with this producer, and they called up the producer and said, "We're looking for a new band for Julio," 
And uh, do you know any keyboardists? So he leaned over to me and said, hey, you know any keyboardists who want to do the Julio gig? And I said, sure, call my friend. So they called my friend, he got the gig, and then two weeks later they asked him, you know any drummers who can do this gig? And <laughs> he paid it back to me and said, you know, call me, and then we both did the tour together. Yes! Yeah, that's awesome. Oh, man, I love hearing those stories. I was in the right place to get that phone call, but it wasn't even for me, it was for a recommendation, but fortunately my recommendation, you know, paid it back. <laughs> yeah, that was so awesome. That's how you do it, man. I, I thought it was going to be a curveball where I was like, I thought you played drums for Julio, but you also said you played piano. Yeah, the beginning. Yeah, he didn't so we were like, like, what going what? on here? Yeah, right? Yeah. Damn. Yeah, my piano skills are, are very basic, so yeah, <laughs> not enough to win an audition. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I got to ask, so like you're wearing an Iron Maiden shirt, but you played for Julio Iglesias and also DMX and like Shakira. What, like in 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 the conservatory of music, what was your favorite subject? Because you said you went from classical to jazz to like, which one did you like love? I don't or had more. I don't know anything. What was your favorite? Well, the funny thing was, I went for four years, and the first maybe th two to two and a half years, I didn't want to do anything but practice the drum set. Mm. Everything else was a distraction. They're like, oh, now you have to study timpani. I'm like, damn it. Uh -huh. Or now you have to. Study I have to take ear training, you know, all that singing solfege. I'm like, damn it. Yeah. All I want to do is get better at the drums, right? And then when I was about a junior, all I wanted to do was take other courses other than play the drums. I want to take composition, theory. I started going over to the other side of campus and taking like psychology and, oh, wow. and courses on philosophy and religion and all these different things just to get out of music because I was burning myself out with the amount of just drumming and, and stuff I was studying. So I don't know if I had uh any one particular favorite course but i really i mean i would say maybe uh man let, i'll tell a story i took this one jazz composition class which i was way like it way out of it was out of my league right yeah i just signed, signed up for it and i go in there and there was just amazing sax players and trumpet player i mean uh, uh piano players there, all just who have great ears and knowledge of harmony and me Mm -hmm. And I don't, you know, I know a C major chord and a, like a, <laughs> what I, and they're like, they're all singing notes. Like this is the, uh, the, the, the sharp nine on this chord. And I'm like, oh, oh dude, I, I am out of my league. Right. So I went up to the teacher after the first class, I said, because the first assignment was, you know, go write a piece and bring it in for the next class. And I'm like, oh, I, I oh. thought it was going to be like more baby steps. I'm in the wrong class. He's like, no, no, no. Sit down next to me. He goes, sit down next to me at the piano. He goes, pick any note on the piano. And I'm like, um, C. He goes, ah, that's great. Uh, pick any chord that has a C in it. And I'm like, C. He's like, <laughs> all right, I'll pick another chord. I mean, pick another note. And I'm like, uh, G. He's like, great. Now pick any chord that has a G in it. And I'm like, G major. <laughs> He's like, okay, go back to the first one. Go back to the second one. Go back to the first one. Go back to the second one. You wrote your first song. Goodbye. <laughs> and he really, this guy's name was Ron Miller. So he really had the ability to teach like highly sophisticated, trained musicians and beginners in the same class. Wow. So he really got me over that insecurity of being a drummer and not being able to compose or, or write or hear anything. And, and I think I learned so much in that one semester because he kind of ushered me along with all the advanced students. And I could have just quit and say, screw this, you know, but he you know, it was great. So wow. the, having the right teacher sometimes really helps push you along. Damn. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like, uh, I actually went, I know you taught at AMI for a while, right? And still yeah, I'm like, a, I'm like a part-time teacher there. Yeah, mm. yeah. Because I, 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 I went there in 2008. And I just remember, like, one of the classes, it's not a class. It was, um, it, do you know Schroeder? He's a uh, piano sure. player, jazz guy. He's an older dude. I'm, I don't know if he still works there. But in 2008, he was there. He's he's kind of the inspiration for Schroeder in the Peanuts. Oh, really? Yeah, that's that's oh, what. Oh, wow. It's, but whatever. But uh, he has this jazz uh, trio thing where you have to go, not trio, but it's like two guitar players, a bass player, and a drummer. And you would have to go on like every week. It's like a club, and then you would go play jazz. And then he mm. would just like look at you and be like, yeah, you suck, or you're, you're fast, or swing it, or whatever. And I just remember hating that class, but it's not even a class. It was just like a, like a group or whatever. And uh, I learned so much from it, and I still felt like I was the worst player in the whole thing. 
But because I'm a rock guy. And then he's yeah. like, okay, I have to try to figure out how to play jazz. Like, you literally have to play over chord changes and then all of these different things and improvise the whole yeah. fucking time. You can't write anything out. Like, he'll know that, hey, you you played that before. Yeah. Don't yeah. play it again. Yeah, it was just, it was crazy. But yeah, the oh, wow. right teacher. That's what I'm just getting to. Right. Will teach you so much. And like, now yeah. I know like four jazz chords. I'll never use them. <laughs> but I know. Right in your pocket. All thanks to Schroeder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that yeah. was cool. That was cool. Damn. Yeah, so, so how did you get to, what led you to go to L.A.? Well, I was, uh, I guess when I got out of this conservatory, I was working a lot in the Miami music scene. Uh, playing with a whole lot of bands, rock bands and original projects and things. And I was also doing recordings in local studios and uh, started to do some bigger tours. Like we talked about the Julio tour or the Shakira tour. I started doing those out of Miami. And then I think I felt like two things. One, I really did want to move at some point. I didn't want to live in Florida the rest of my life. So I always thought I was going to move back to New York or something. Um and uh, another thing was, as I was touring, I was coming through L.A. a lot and I was working with a lot of L.A. musicians, like maybe i will be on a tour and the percussionist lived in L.A. or I'd be on a tour and the bassist lived in L.A. So I started bef befriending musicians that were based out of here. And it didn't seem so foreign or so daunting after I met a bunch of people and became friends with them. Mm. So at a certain point, I said, I, I should move and... At this point, maybe I have more friends in L.A. than I do in New York City. So maybe I'll I'll switch my plans and I'll move to the West Coast. So I did that instead. And it was great. It was great. I mean, it's been everything I've wanted it to be uh, as far as not only a nice place to live, but also the music scene and the style of music and the music, the friends I've met here and made here have all been great. Wow. So that, that was 2004. Oh, cool. Nice. I'm sure like it helps also with like creativity, writing. There's a lot of d terrains here and stuff as well. Like, you know. Yeah. I mean, at the time, I remember around 1998 to 2001 or something. I was, you know, back when we still listened to CDs. Yeah. I used to read CDs constantly. I'd read the credits and memorize names. Where was this mastered? Where was this mixed? You know, who did this? Who, did, who played on this? Who did, who did the arrangement of that? And I felt like so much stuff that I love was all coming out of LA. Yeah. So I'm like, man, I'm trying to imitate the sounds that that are coming out of here. I'm trying to imitate imitate the drum sounds or the playing or the recording techniques or whatever. Maybe I should just move there and try to meet some of these people or work with some of these people. Maybe that would be a better move than just trying to fake it and do an imitation of the LA sound, you know? Yeah. So I learned when I moved here, you know, just meeting people and, you know, learning from them. Yeah. Oh, what what would be your favorite studio that you've worked on here in LA? Like, is, do you have? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, they, they all have their own thing, but I mean, there are there are the classics. The yeah. classics where you feel like you're they're like a holy place because they have all these amazing records on the walls, and that's kind of fun. Like uh, an ocean, the ocean, ocean way, east right. west, or like Sunset Sound. The village, um, those those are cool for that reason. But then I really like these studios that just have a ton of gear laying around. Yeah. You know, yeah. instead of being this like holy shrine that you walk into and it's empty, and and then you bring your drum set, you play, and you leave. It's kind of fun to walk into these studios where there's gear laying everywhere, yeah. and like there's drums piled in the corner, and there's old microphones everywhere. And it's 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 a bit of like an inspiration just to say, oh, what? How does that sound? And let me set this up. And last week I was at a studio called The Boulevard, mm -hmm. which I hadn't been to before. Yeah, and there was a pile of great drums in the corner, and I didn't even bring. I think I might have had sticks in my hands. That was it. And <laughs> just walking everything that was there, just because it, it's fun for me to use other people's equipment and and different sounds. So I think now I I like those studios that have just tons of gear. Um, I haven't recorded at this one yet. I think it's called 64 Sound or some 64 Sound, mm -hmm. uh, but it used to be called King Size, and then they they but that they they had the same thing, just stacks of old drums in the corner, and you would just pick and choose and hit them. I'm like, that's pretty cool. That's yeah. pretty cool. 
that's fun for me. Rather than always going to these pristine places, I like those mid-level studios that are just a little bit more bohemian looking. And <laughs> I mean, I, okay, I, now you just reminded me that I've recorded three times at Abbey Road in London, oh. and that I've had that exp I've had that feeling where I get there and I'm just like a like like I'm in awe. Yeah, like yeah. I, I'm just. So I, I just walk around and I look at the different studios and I always ask some someone who works there, can I get a tour? And they're like, yeah, yeah, come, come with me. And they open up all these closets and they show you all the old Beatles gear. That's the old piano they used here. That's the old recording. Because they have it all like yeah. stored away. And they're not they're not supposed to show people, but they're like, if you ask them, they're like, okay, here, I'll show you this, I'll show you that. And this is the old reverb room. This is the old, so that every time I go there, I feel like a little kid because I ask again. I'm like, can I get the tour again? <laughs> oh my god, that's nuts! I've Damn. never been. I've never been there. That sounds insane, though. Damn. Yeah, that and that also you're going there to record. You know, yeah. I think they do like like being a part of something that's like also something that you're creating is adds to the whole thing like i'm pretty sure they give maybe tours to like normal people if you pay or something mm. i don't know but that's oh, probably yeah. going to be the way i get in right <laughs> that, yeah. <laughs> yeah instead of like recording yeah that's thing. crazy you're like fuck i'm like here to record like, do you know is... by the way uh who, what did you record there if i if we may ask let's see uh what did i do there i did the first time i think i was there it was for a um it was a Shakira recording session. We were doing some um, something. Uh, yeah, I know what it was. She was she wanted to do like kind of acoustic unplugged versions of her hits to have like alternate versions. So while we were on tour, she booked a couple of days there and we just went in and kind of re-recorded some of her singles, but like just like acoustic guitar, bongo shaker or something. Yeah. So she Harmonica, had like a right? That was cool. The second time was to do something for, there's an artist named Minnie Driver. She's an actress, but she also sings. Mm -hmm. So we did, um, I don't remember what we did there for her, but we did some recordings for her there. And the third time I was there, I did an album for this Brazilian artist named Roberto Carlos. Mm -hmm. And he's, okay, he's kind of like another one of those Julio Iglesias, Frank Sinatra dudes, but from Brazil. When I first got called to work with him, I didn't realize how big he was. And I asked a few Brazilian friends of mine, they're like, oh, he's the biggest artist ever in Brazil. I'm like, oh, no way. Maybe I should learn about this. Yeah. <laughs> so I went and I did an album for him. And it was uh, we wound up learning, I guess, a bunch of his songs and then re-recording -re versions in Abbey Road and then doing it in front of a live audience. Uh, so he made a DVD out of it also. So that was it. Um, it was pretty cool because then like the, uh, the engineer makes sure to let you know like uh, your bass drum like that's the Ringo bass drum mic that was on this album and like he kind of oh, points yeah. it out like all freaking out a little bit. Damn! Oh my God! Wait, um, didn't she? Is that the uh, the unplug session with Shakira? Did, is that the one she won a Grammy for? Is she yeah. like yeah, dude? Bam! That's so sick. Yeah, yeah Shakira... that was that was one of the one of the first gigs I did with her. That was probably ninety nine. So I've been in the band for a while, but. Uh, yeah, um, I recorded a record in 98 and then uh, we did a couple shows and then we put together a band to do an unplugged show in New York, like back when MTV used to do MTV unplugs. I don't know if they still do, mm. but it was fun. And so she put together a band and most of those guys are still in her band now, like for all these years from that from that concert. That's badass. Uh, yeah, like uh, a lot of people don't like they might not actually know, but I, I feel like Shakira's like as a pop star, like a real musician too. Like yeah. she's a harmonica player, right? And she's, uh, uh, there's a there's a lot of other like European or like pop stars or even like from Latin America they're, where they're not like as musicians as Shakira. I always thought right. Shakira was like a musician, musician too. Yeah. Well, she's the best thing, uh, Her one of her best qualities is she has really good ears as far as like she, she can hear like there could be a million things going on in one wrong note and she hears the wrong note. She's like, oh, there was something that happened here. And then, so, you know, so when she plays harmonica, she she's not like a virtuoso harmonica, but she she knows the melody she wants. So she just figures it out. Yeah. And then she's like, OK, I got it. Hit record. So she, yeah. she finds the melody she wants to do and she can do the same thing. Like, um, you know, if she wants she can tell the guitar player what guitar solo she wants. She just sings the notes to him. 
It's like, I kind of wanted to go like this and this and this and then end on this note. And the guy's like, all right, cool. So <laughs> she might not be like, you know, like yeah. on any of the inch, but she, she can sing all the parts to people if she wants them. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, at times we do that with the drums too. I'm like, what, what kind of fill do you want here? And she's like, I don't know, maybe like a uh, or something. I'm yeah. like, okay, got, got, got it, you know? <laughs> so, you know, it's, when you work with someone else, it's kind of fun to figure out what they're hearing in their head, you know, as yeah. opposed to giving them something else that they might not, they might be like, oh, that's good. But it was kind of a B plus for them. You want to get the, the A plus, you know, so you want to figure out what are you really hearing? Yeah. You know? And uh, yeah, so that's that. And yeah, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of different pop, pop stars out there. There's the ones who can dance and can't sing. There's the ones who can <laughs> sing and can't move and then there's like you know once you play a million instruments and yeah. but can't write there's ones who write well and can't sing and so it's it and they all they're all great yeah. but it's it's fun to have you know, to work with someone who's kind of got most of that stuff together yeah so you kind of go in any direction that's so awesome. cool you just made collaboration sound way more fun than you know than most people do because yeah you're right it's like it's this cool like uh you know you just kind of work together to try to find like you know, you try to get that A plus thing when, you know, the vision, you're trying to achieve the vision, you know, sometimes that comes off to me as someone who's like collaborates here and there. I'm always like, oh man, I'm always uh, apprehensive to go into it. I'm like, all right, let's work. Let's hammer this out or, but that's, that's awesome. Especially with Shakira too. She's such a badass. She's just like perfect pitch and like, damn man. It, it's funny because I think when I was a lot younger, I used to, I had a hard time letting go of some of my ideas. I'm like, you know what, this is the right drum sound for this song, or this is the right beat for this section, or this is the right whatever. And someone's like, no, it's gotta be this way. And and then I butt heads with people, you know? Right. And it's hard to collaborate that way. Yeah. yeah. And I don't wanna say I like I, I'm not opinionated. I still have tons of opinions, but I'm way more open minded than I used to be. Right. So now I have my opinions, but I'm willing to try someone else's, or I'm willing to meet halfway sometimes because in the end we're just trying to finish this thing and put it out you know right. if both, both sides argue to the point where you just don't even do anything then <laughs> it doesn't see the light of day yeah it's better to say like yeah i kind of think that this is the right tempo or this thing but i'll try what you're feeling you want it more laid back or you want it more this or okay you know and and i'm i'm down with all that style of collaboration because that way you're 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 putting out more stuff you know you're like like i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do that and the idea is like to, to have a I think a, a healthy output, a healthy production of, of, of material, not to sit there and, and, you know, micromanage one thing that never actually comes out because you won't let go or something. Uh, so yeah, I, I, and it, it, it becomes more fun. I mean, now, I mean, I have a big computer set up over here, but now I do most of my sessions remotely, which means people just email me songs and I record drums and I send them back. The communication is very, small now mm -hmm. i tr i try to pull ideas out of people in emails i'm like yeah. what do you think of the song like or i ask them questions like do you have a favorite drum sound or what's your favorite band right now or something because so i can get us a, a launching point because i can do anything you know i could do like super 80s super grunge super like steely dan i could go anywhere with like the drum sounds or the drum parts so it helps if i can kind of figure out what the other party is into yeah. like if they have super big brash ringy sounds or they want like the super dead dry thing uh, i don't know so uh yeah i got an email day from harry farrell from uh, jane's addiction so i'm gonna tomorrow record a song for him and the song he sent me is kind of electro dancey you know so i'm like okay so it's gonna be that thing so I wrote him back saying, got the song, sounds great. He's like, yeah, and don't be afraid to go full Phil Spector wall of sound on this. I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> because I was going to go like, you know, pure like, you know, Euro dance on this thing. And, and But he's like, yeah, go, get, get organic and go retro on this thing. I'm like, all right, now I got to rethink this, you yeah. know. But that's the fun thing about collaboration is someone has these these ideas or shouts out these colors or paradigms or qualities. And you're like, oh, let me try to mix that with what I was hearing. And um, now I am the exact opposite of the, how I was when I was, you know, 21. Now I'm all about the collaboration because I think that's the best way for me not to repeat myself over and over again. Yeah. You know, if I if you ask me just to 
play the play the drums, I'll probably do something similar over and over and over again. But if I work with different people and I get different ideas and sources, then it's going to cause me to evolve and search for different things. Right? Yeah, Damn, that's, that's cool. freaking awesome. That's so like, that's just good. I like, I love that. <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah, for me, it's just a uh, collaboration helps take the the heaviness from it. Because if it's all on you too, then it's it's crushing. But if you're collaborating, you know, if it doesn't turn out so well. Not all my fault. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it takes it. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, it's all good. And That's... side note, Derek, Derek has a band with uh, Steve Perkins. I'm in a band with Stephen Perkins. Um, uh, oh, yeah. I was gonna say you're both drummers and you're working with the same singer and. But that's cool no, that you guys are friends. In pure, pure awe of him. I grew up listening to him, and every time I get a chance to hang with him, I let him know that I'm like, dude, I learned all of your drum parts, and I <laughs> love. And he's super nice. We we sat next to each other on an airplane once, and oh. and super nice. And he's like, hey man, so you're doing Perry's new thing? That's cool. I'm like, Oof. <laughs> <laughs> kill me or something. But he's like, nah, man, that's cool because it's a. I mean, Perry's solo stuff is so different from Jane's, yeah, and right. I think he knows that. And so um, it's uh, you know, there's a two different skill sets almost. You know, I could never. I, I do a poor man's version of Stephen Perkins, and uh, <laughs> and so I do a much better version of myself. So I just yeah. stick to that. That's uh, awesome. awesome. Oh, that's fun. that was the best impression ever, <laughs> too, because he just he does that, and he's he is just so he just emulates just like positivity. He's just positive, like boom. Uh, like I, I'm such you? a such a fan of his. Not only his drumming his work body of work but also just since i've met him he's been just so nice to me and i'm like wow that that shows you like what kind of person he is too yeah you know yeah. Per perkins uh plays with no shoes on and like no socks do you do that is that weird is could you imagine i can i can it doesn't bother me either way i mean i don't like playing with like i don't know like 70s platform shoes on yeah. or something like that but <laughs> But I mean, I I guess like either barefoot or Vans or Chuck Taylors. That's about as far as I can go. Nice. Because I, I kind of want to feel the pedals like a little bit. You know, I don't want it to be like just I'm stomping with clogs on or something. Yeah. Yep. But barefoot, I mean, I probably don't do that live just because of the logistics of walking on and off stage and yep. like sanitary reasons. But. <laughs> That's crazy. When because when I saw it happen, it it tripped me out because I'm a guitar player and it's kind of like. Uh, like playing without a pick, which is totally cool, but you kind of have to be like Jeff Beck to do that shit, or I don't, you have to really like I don't know. I just feel like that'd be crazy. Like your skin is touching yeah. metal. Yeah, that's a weird thing. One of my favorite guitar players is Richie Kotzen, and he yeah. completely threw out the pick now. Yeah, and he does all that crazy stuff without it. So that's how I'm like afraid of like hurting my hurting myself. And I was just thinking, like, if I was a drummer not having shoes, I would break my pinky toes. Yeah, there's like, chains. Just, and like, there's, like, yeah, chains there. It'd, get, it'd and be like, so like, many things sticking If you do it long enough, you have the sensitivity to know not to bash your foot into the chains or something. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, like, um, yeah, my friend plays in Richie Kotzen's band, uh, Mike Bennett. And then, oh, uh, cool. And then uh, uh, Jeff Beck, I saw him live once years ago, and... Blew my mind because I'm a huge guitar player fan. Like I've lived, many of my roommates have been guitar players, so I just I've learned like all the gods of guitar. Yeah. So one time uh, years ago, Jeff Beck was playing live, and my friends are like, "We're going. You have to see this guy." And I'm like, "Oh, I've heard Blow by Blow and Wired. I got it." He's yeah. like, "No, no, no. You got to see him live." Yeah. So I went to see him, and yeah, first of all, he had a Strat with like I think maybe no pedals or maybe only a couple i couldn't tell like none yeah no pick just <laughs> and, and i there's sounds coming out of the guitar i'd never heard of before and and i'm this is insane he's so good and he his rhythm guitarist in the band at the time was jennifer batten oh was yeah burning also i mean so she had like a rhythm guitarist who was also just ripping and then he came out and did a solo where he takes one of those like uh, pedal steel slides, those like bars, yeah. and he just with that on his guitar, and I'm just flipping out. And I still remember, like, it was just so unique. Like I'd never seen a guitarist with that technique or that sound. And I think you know, pretty much all guitarists, one way or another, kind of worship him in some way, you know. But yeah, it freaked me out. You were talking about the no pick thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so cool. Yeah, yeah. Jeff, he's like the sound. He's the or. 
and uh, him live too. Like people really, oh my god, that, it's just live is just such a different thing. Like you said, and like I, what I like about him is like his he could do anything that night. You go see him. He doesn't really he could do any set list he wants, and like mm -hmm. uh, of course w ending with maybe. Um, a day in a life, you know, like that's his, uh, you know, but like, I feel like he can just like do some weird, like Charlie Parker song and then do some blow, blow, blow stuff or like maybe a Yardbird song, but you can, yeah, you Charlie Mingus stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And he always has like a new, like I saw him once and he had a cellist doing, um, being his, like, I guess rhythm the whole show. Like it was him, a cellist, a, uh, I think, I think a bass. Oh no, no, no. It was him, a cellist, a drummer. I think uh, I can't remember who it was, but it was a badass mother person, and yeah. um, and maybe a bass player. But it was just like this weird four piece, and it was like incredible. And um, I don't know, it was crazy. Steve Vai was there, and Steve Vai was like, "He's the chosen one." <laughs> I was like, "Damn." Okay, so the final five. Um, final five. Final five. Okay, here we go. Uh, you, uh, you first, me first, oh, yeah. me first, me first. Okay, what is the most important piece of gear or secret weapon uh, while on tour or in the studio? Mm. For a drummer, the most important uh, thing for me, gosh. Um, I'm sorry to waste time because there's so many, but I would say here's something that people don't realize. For drums, specifically for drums, a good seat and a good rug will, yeah. will, will, it, it sounds so silly. Like it sounds like you're talking about Home Depot or something. Yeah. <laughs> but you can have the most amazing drum set, but if you don't have a rug and your chair's garbage, you can't play. You can't play. Yeah. I'll play a garbage drum set and have a really nice drum thrown and a nice rug underneath so things don't slide. People don't realize how much drums vibrate and tilt and slide when you're playing them. So I always think like, I, I call someone. I'm like, hey, so I'm um, coming. Is there are there drums there? Is there a rug there? How's this? How's the chair? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Bring like a rug and a chair and throw it in my trunk. Even if they say don't bring anything, like the, the we got drums here. I'm like I'm just gonna bring one just in case because that will make or break your performance. Yeah. It's like you're all off balance and things are sliding and rocking around. So that's something specifically to drums. I think people don't realize, but every drummer will admit that that's like make or break for them. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I remember playing gigs where there was, I think it was like Huntsville, Alabama, and we played at a, a distillery in between the two things that actually make beer. And it was a f fucked up gig for many reasons. But one, there was no PA. But that was uh -huh. a different thing. But also, we had no rugs, so the drums drummer would keep pulling back his... His is a uh, <laughs> war tom or whatever. Oh, his kick drum, kick drum. You just keep pulling it back, and then at one point I had to just keep my leg there to try to help it, but still yeah. like it just goes everywhere. And it's cement. It was like nice yeah. pure cement. It was like it was insane. I've had those gigs. It's a nightmare, and you're you're asked to keep steady time while pulling gear. So you're like one handed, like and pulling stuff the whole time. It's just the worst experience yeah. for a drummer to play that way. I'd rather be like hailing on me or something than than that you know yeah. wow Just, on fire as long as your shit doesn't move yeah don't it's, move yeah yeah it's like a house moving like no yeah, it's literally I, it's, I, I need see, the this house. is exactly how it's going it's going like this and he's like getting this it's nah, like in the beat like, boom, yeah yeah God, boom God. And you know like it was like high intense rock and roll so it's going crazy like it's <laughs> it's not fun for anybody Oh, no. We can't even put our bass drum, a bass amp, or anything, or any amp in front of it because it's gonna vibrate. It's just gonna yeah. be weird, you know. So damn. So yeah. that's good. Sounds so that's, simple, but it's so true. Like a eighteen dollar rug would solve all of that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Damn. Number two. Number two. What is your most memorable story from the road or crazy, crazy memorable story? Crazy memorable stories. Let's see. Um, a lot of them I can't tell on air. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, know, I know. We've had some that had to do with D.D. Allen and things like that. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah, crazy stuff. Yeah, but it's all right. So uh, yeah, I'm a I'm a pretty chill, you know, <laughs> wholesome guy. But I have lots of those crazy stories too. But let's see. Um, That's why I said memorable too. Yeah, memorable is. Just... Uh, I I would say a couple, but one of them would be. I just thought of the other day I did it. I, I remember once doing a show in the Apollo Theater in New York. Mm. 
And what was cool about that was I, it was, ah, we're cool. It's We're in the Apollo Theater. This is really cool. It's a legendary place. But then I remember looking in the audience and there was uh, the front row was like Bill Clinton, uh, bon- the U2, like The Edge, Bono, <laughs> Chris Rock was there. And they're all just kind of like, and I'm playing and they're all just kind of nodding going, <laughs> I'm like, this is pretty cool. So yeah. like, oh, fuck. I'm, looking at the show, I'm like, that's a cool lineup. I can't remember who else was there, but I'm like, that is a cool lineup right there. So Damn. I'm like, this is pretty cool. But that that just got, cause like cause a photo like popped up on my um on my like laptop like uh Memories story thing. And I'm like, oh that. man, I forgot about that one. That one was cool. But another one I, I think I can think of is like so I grew up in New Jersey and there's a lot of <laughs> classic venues there, like uh Giant Stadium, well, you know, yeah. um and MSG, Madison Square Garden. So I think playing those places and getting to invite my parents out and you know getting them backstage passes and putting oh. them in the audience is maybe the the best thing you can do as a son is to say, look, you know, look, I'm not a homeless person anymore. Like, like, <laughs> so, that, I'm, so yeah, that was that was always big for me was like to get when I, when we came through those big venues, I would always make sure I, the most important thing is can we get my parents in and put them in some nice seats, you know, yeah. Yeah. So that that's that's important for me. Oh, Damn. yeah, that is. Like when you said they have some nice venues, I was thinking like small clubs because that's like for me, like oh, the whiskey. I'm not even thinking Madison Square Garden. <laughs> yeah. like, MSG is that uh, like uh, like some like the mm, CBDBs? Yeah. Uh, like <laughs> no. Small, uh, small, no. God. Well, wow, uh, I would say keep in mind that no one's there to see me. I'm there playing with other artists. If you put my name on the marquee, it would be like tumbleweeds going by. You know? Oh nah, nah, you no! Know. Come on, Brent. I mean, I mean, your backing band stood in front of you this time. So. Yeah, exactly. You keep your exactly. band in front of you. Yeah. Just, yeah no. They're just backing you up. <laughs> yeah. Keeping people away from you. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay, number three. Number I'm, three. I always love asking this question. What are your tips for songwriting? Tips for songwriting. I would say, let's see if I have any tips, because I do co-write with people. I would say, um, um, well, a couple tips. I would say just, just move forward. You know, don't stop and think too much in the early stages. You know, put down whatever lyrics come to mind. Put down, like, write whatever, whatever chords come to mind. Sing whatever melody comes to mind. You can always refine it later. Always. But don't sit there and come up with the best first four bars and say, I'm going to work on these four bars for a week. Not just come up with chords, chord progressions, sounds, lyrics, you know, nonsense lyrics even, you know. And then you can always rewrite that stuff and kind of hone it in later. I think it's that you, what you're searching for are good ideas, right. good ideas, right. a great rhythm, a great melody, a great chord progression, great catchy lyric. And don't sit there and like and hold yourself back. You know, it's just about keep moving forward, moving forward, moving forward. I think that's a thing. It's like uh, driving in Manhattan. I always tell people like, you're like, I can never drive in Manhattan. It's too crazy. I'm like, all you got to do is just don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> You know, if, if you have to go here and, and you, you missed it, just don't slam on the brakes. Just go around the block and come back again. And like, yeah. just people freak out when 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 you stop in New York and all the horns go off and the swears and the, you know, yeah. the. but just 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 flow, just flow like, you know, like red blood cells in your arteries or something. Just flow. And I think uh, the writing process, I think it's kind of like that. Just keep flowing with ideas. Don't get too judgmental in the beginning and say, oh, this is a bad idea. This is a bad idea. That's a bad idea. Just move forward, move forward, write down everything or record everything and, you know, come back to it later. And uh, I would say another idea would be um, uh, with lyrics, Uh, you know, not in the beginning, because I said, just write down nonsense. It's not, but at a certain point, sit back and think, what am I trying to say? You know, I, when I'm when I'm writing lyrics with other people and, and I'm like and they ha- they have all these lyrics and I'm like okay can you explain to me what this song is about and they're like well it's sort of like it's like a feeling as though you know kind of like the sentiment of loss and I'm like oh no you already lost yeah. me yeah. let's let's come up with a more honed in story for this song you know is it a a guy is it a girl yeah. when what time when like what's the setting you know what happened you know what happened to him why does he have that feeling of loss you know yeah. we don't have to say everything but you need to have an idea in your mind of what right. you're trying to say 
even if you don't say it all literally, it could be yeah. totally abstract, like, you know, you know, I am the walrus or something. <laughs> but but at least in your mind, have an idea of like what what the setting is and what you're trying to say. And then you can be as abstract as you want, you know. So that's something. Uh, else. Oh, man, that explains a lot of songs like I'm the walrus or actually like some of those Jane's Addiction songs. I, I read those lyrics. I'm like, damn, like this is very like. I can tell it's about something, but sometimes I really have to read it for weeks. Like, where are you go? Like, so he, the adjectives and the stuff. I'm like, whoa, this is like super abstract, and it feels really yeah. crazy. But I yeah. love the lyrics that are super abstract. You don't know what's going on, and then you ask the songwriter. He tells you exactly what it's about. Yeah, like, oh, it was about 18 year old uh, uh, my brother when he was 18, and he kind of like you know pushed me uh, into a lake, and I was freezing, and I was totally mad at him, and then I went home, and then we fought, and then and I'm like. I didn't know that was what that was what? about, but yeah. you have a specific, you know, memory, and he wrote that song about that memory. But it sounds so abstract and universal to the listener. Yeah. I love yeah. that. That's genius. Yeah, that's another thing I always think too. Like you, sometimes, it, being super specific is super awesome, but then also making it a little bit universal. You have to back off too mm -hmm. sometimes. Great. Right. I agree. That's good. Like it's almost like okay, I I probably talked about the Beatles already like two or three times in this podcast but that's one of the things about if you look at McCartney's lyrics and John Lennon's lyrics you know McCartney's lyrics are super narrative it's a story and you're following characters yeah and it's like and John Lennon's lyrics are just abstract and like it's like he's just threw words together but it all comes together in some kind of cool picture yeah. you know and and it's both work both are really cool you know one's a specific story with characters and other one's just ideas and phrases and yeah. you, know, you can kind of experiment with both man i think that's why mccartney's my favorite really lennon's my favorite that's why the beatles are just but the my best. daughter's named lennon also but but yeah. mccartney is my favorite yeah uh, actually it's george is my favorite and uh mccartney's my favorite from the two but yeah yeah harrison's best Who, who's your favorite beetle brendan Brendan. Uh, probably Ringo. Ringo, he's the man. Yeah, <laughs> because no one says that. <laughs> yeah, peace. He got the most fan mail, apparently. Yeah, yeah. I think I, th I think the the statistic statistic is he had the first post Beatles hit, also I think, or something, or first post Beatles number one hit. I can't remember what the oh, wow. weird statistic was, but um, no, nah, I mean, come on, it's the it's the collective. It's yeah. the collective. Yeah. Like, I don't like any of their solo careers as much as they are together, but I think I'm not the only one who said that. So, mm -hmm. but I do love solo Lennon. I do love uh, Wings, and I do love um, uh, that first uh, All Things Must Pass. Oh, oh, okay. record. I mean, it's all great. So talented. Yeah. yeah I mean, they were a true super band. Yeah. Yeah. And also, Ringo has a storyline in The Simpsons. Mars is like after him, like right. That was the whole thing. Mars is super into Ringo. Oh, oh yeah, wow. yeah. There's a whole episode. I'll find it. Well, I'll send you a link. <laughs> <laughs> it's very important. Very important. You have to watch, <laughs> have to watch that episode. Damn. Good episode. She's in love with him. She loves him like a mother trucker. <laughs> and before we go to number four, I gotta say, I don't know if you've seen that interview with like they asked. They're all like it's like 1968. They're all like on a panel and they're like. Is uh they asked like John like hey John like is is Ringo the best drummer in the world and then like John Lennon's like Ringo's not even the best drummer in the band. <laughs> no, so mean. <laughs> He's so mean. But Ringo's a genius. He's like a really good drummer. But it's just funny. He's pick on. Him. Yeah. No, if if you want to like talk about that like so when I was younger, I was all about John Bonham, right? Okay. John Bonham, come on, come on. He is the greatest rock and roll drummer ever. And I loved Mitch Mitchell too. And I mean, yeah. and so then you go to like, listen to Ringo Starr and you're like, what's the big deal? You know, if you come from John Bonham and Mitch Mitchell, it, it what's the big deal, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, and then I got a little more mature and I realized that the, the drum parts are so good. Note for note, perfect, perfect in the Beatles, you know? And, and then you get even further along where I started recording for people and you realize that the Ringo Starr vocabulary, like his beats and drum fills, are like 85% of studio drumming. Like if you don't know his stuff, then you are useless in the studio. Yeah. His tones, his drum fills, you know, his parts, 
that is the that's like the bible of pop rock studio drumming and then you sprinkle in a few other things but really that's the majority so i would say just listen to him if you're a drummer and you're like i don't really get it just listen to him solely for the vocabulary that he just injected into pop music it's what every drummer has to know you know right. all yeah. spills like that's the beatles man like uh if if you know at least like if you learn songwriting from the beatles yeah. like that's how you learn songwriting yeah they wrote on every goddamn chord progression like they're you learn songwriting from the beatles yeah. you can learn drums you can learn uh rhythm guitar it's like a mm -hmm. school the mm -hmm. beatles you just like yeah s vocals and everything like, lead guitar maybe go van halen yeah <laughs> or jimmy jimmy, yeah, jimmy yeah, but okay number four yes number four number four what is your favorite technique or lick that has helped your playing favorite technique or lick uh, that has helped my drumming yeah. uh, uh, I would say uh, one of the things is um, for me personally is on drums is learning subdivision meaning learning how to feel and turn on and off subdivision and how I can explain that in a super nerdy way is if I'm playing a beat like doom ka doom ka doom Ga, doom, ga. Those are quarter notes, right? Yeah. If if you're a, if you're a drummer or not a drummer. So if I were going to divide that into eighth notes, don't, ga, don't, ga, don't, ga, don't, ga. I'm adding an eighth note subdivision in there. Yeah. I'm going to add sixteen notes. Right. Yeah. Adding triplet yeah. subdivisions. Don't. Doom, ka, doom. So with the same doom, ka, doom, ka, yeah. I'm I'm learning how to divide up the spaces in between the notes. Uh, you can do like a halftime shuffle. Doom, ka, doom, ka, doom, ka, doom. So really, if I'm just practicing a simple beat of kick, snare, kick, <laughs> snare, and then I really work on cutting up the spaces in between in every different way like on the hi-hat or on the ghost notes on the snare but getting super militant about it and shedding it and shedding it and shedding it like so it's like machine gun level accurate that has helped my drumming so much it's not getting wishy-washy with the space in between but as a drummer to really 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 master all those notes in between the main kick and snare notes you know yeah, yeah. helped a lot with my studio playing with my playing along with loops with my overdubs you know percussion overdubs and everything is really knowing that area of subdivisions and being able to turn it on and turn it off so if i go like you know being able to yeah turn on and off like a dial yeah that's been a good thing personally as a drummer for me oh damn that's freaking damn that's super awesome and also i have a side note to say like i don't think you need a drum set when you go to the studio just need a few mics and then you can yeah <laughs> you can just... i get closer to what i'm hearing in my head just by yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, dude you, like as guitar players you know there's like this Jimi hendrix thing that we do that and a few other guitar players where we play the solo and we sing it at the same time. Have oh, you ever thought oh, yeah. about playing drums and singing at the same time? Like, yeah. Well, maybe I've thought about it, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I've really got to take it to fruition. I don't see a point, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I do sing a lot of drum parts just to communicate. It's yeah. like some people don't read like kick snare drum music, so you just sing them apart. Like, what are you hearing? Boom, ka, ba boom, boom, ka. Or are you hearing boom? Ka, boom, ba, boom, ka. Which one are you hearing? And they go, ah, I'm hearing the first one. Cool. Ah. You know, it's much easier than saying, are you hearing a one, two, three, and a, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sing, them the, sing them the part and then let them decide. It's a really easy way. We were talking about collaborating before. It's a really easy way to collaborate. Yeah. I'm going to sing you two drum fills. Tell me if you like A or B better, you know. And then they go, A, cool. Got it. Boom. Damn. Forward. Quick. quick, forward moving. Boom. Yeah. That's awesome. Forward motion. Okay, all right, the last question. Final five. The final fifth five. 
um, okay, what is the best advice you can you would give a person looking to do what you do? The best advice um, would be um, well, it's it's simple to say practice, uh, but you would have to practice a lot. But besides that, my the real advice that uh, would be don't give up because um, the difference between what I do and what a lot of drummers who who don't pr play professionally, the difference between us is I just didn't quit. And <laughs> like because I don't I don't at an earlier age, I don't know if I was any better than anybody else. I just at a, I, I just decided at a certain point, well, I'm not going to have any options. I'm just going to do this, you know. Um, and cause music, a career in music is, is not easy. And basically every day it's trying to get you to quit music. The, 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 the business of music is actually trying to get you to quit every day wow. for some reason or other, either, uh, bills happen or you, you get your band breaks up or this tour gets canceled or this promoter robs you of your, your, your money or this company never sends you a check or whatever it is. It's like things are constantly happening to make you feel like, oh man, I should just give this up and go work for this or go do that or do this. And the people that continue doing it are the people who say, no, I'm going to persevere through this, you know, little, uh, lull and I'm going to keep doing it. Um, I'm one of those people who, who said like, you know what? No matter how good or how bad it gets, I'm just going to keep doing it. You know, if I if I win a gajillion dollars, I'm just going to keep doing what I do. If I'm penniless, I'm going to try to keep doing what I do. You know, so I think that's that's the quality you need. I think to be a professional musician and probably to do almost anything successfully is just to not give up. You know, uh, I do martial arts also, and there's a saying they often put on walls that says a black belt in martial arts is just the white belt who didn't give up and uh and like it's the same with a professional musician because you're you're always thrown these like roadblocks and you just have to find a way around them or over them you know so that's what i would tell a younger person i would also say uh learn about some finance earlier on <laughs> don't don't wait till you're 55 to say maybe i need a retirement fund you know maybe start that when you're younger you know, that's another thing. Side note is just be a little smarter with your with your extra money. You know, the stuff on the side. Put it away. Yeah. yeah. Damn. Damn. Freaked out. Damn. That, Derek needs that right now. <laughs> I do. I need it all that stuff. Right now. <laughs> Absolutely. Damn. You're 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 laying it down, Brendan. You're laying down the truth right now. And also, mm -hmm. you have a dog. Yeah, you do have a little dog right over there. It was there. Uh, yeah, I have two dogs, a son, and they're all floating around my studio somewhere. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, th this guy's down here, <laughs> uh, hanging out with me. This dog is over here. Yeah. And there's another dog somewhere who keeps on walking in and out. But yeah, that's... they all have full access to this room when they want it. That's <laughs> that's the rule. That's the rule. <laughs> that's the life. That's the room now. Well, all right. Thank you so much, Brendan. This was Thank so you. freaking, this was amazing. This is a, a podcast for musicians, by musicians. We just want to inspire anyone who wants to become a musician or wants to keep, for, or not to give up and just to be informed. And you've truly, oh man, you just helped us so much do that. Thank you so much. Yeah, you inspired uh, us. We got to go practice. Yeah, yeah right. Well, sure. thanks for reaching out. I appreciate you guys uh, contacting me and, uh, and making this happen. Hell yeah. Yes. Maybe next time when the, world is over we'll see you at a jam yeah 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 <gasps> totally yeah fine yeah. hopefully soon there's vaccines maybe yeah. we'll see. apocalyptic camp <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah oh that was badass thank you brendan buckley you were so awesome man thanks for doing our show you are an amazing drummer a great human being great spirit and anyone if you want to work with brendan you can follow him you could go on his website brendanbuckley.com he's a great session drummer if you can afford him remember he is working on a new track with perry farrell maybe a new album and he and he is shakira's boy so yeah uh, but he's in, you know, he's here. He's here in L.A. So yeah. yeah. Oh no, you don't even need to be in L.A. You can, he'll send, he'll, he'll send you stuff via internet. 
<laughs> he will. And everyone, please like and subscribe. And subscribe. It helps us get badass guests like uh, Brendan Buckley. Brendan Buckley. Buckley. So, we need more Brendan Buckleys on yeah. this one. We can have a whole year of Brendan Buckleys if we hit a thousand subscribers. Yeah. So let's do this. Come on, guys. Come on, guys. Yo, yeah. So bye. Bye. -bye. See, you. See you next week.